live from Boston, Massachusetts, it's theCUBE, covering Red Hat Summit 2019. Brought to you by Red Hat. And we are back live in Boston as we continue our coverage here on theCUBE of Red Hat Summit 2019. It is our sixth year here at the show, and this year obviously some huge announcements, a uh, significant moment it's been for Red Hat. We heard from Jim Whitehurst a little bit ago. Uh, Stu Miniman, John Walls, we're now joined as well by Niall Fitzgerald, who is the GM of IT Application Architecture and Design at Spark NZ. Niall, good afternoon, to, or I guess good morning still. We're in the Eastern time zone. Yeah, I think it's we, the middle of the night in New Zealand. Yeah, <laughs> say, so Spark NZ, New Zealand. Uh, tell us a little bit first off about Spark NZ. Um, what the folks back home are doing right now, work-wise, and, uh, and your role with the company. Yeah, so Spark is the um, largest provider of uh, telecommunication services in New Zealand. Uh, all the traditional type of services you'd expect, mobile, broadband, etc. We came out of the um, traditional kind of post office, so we have a, a lot of heritage. Mm -hmm. And in about four years ago, we rebranded from Telecom New Zealand into Spark to represent that we were you know, changing from being a telco into more much, bro much broader range of um, you know, digital services. Yeah. So our purpose is to help all New Zealanders win big in the digital world. Yeah, Niall, step back for a second. Talk to you know, our <laughs> audience that might not know the telecom industry as well as you. I've been an observer and participated in the industry, but you know, back in the dot-com boom, it was like you know, limitless bandwidth and we're going to do all these wonderful things and you know, cloud and digitization have put um, some new opportunities as well as stresses and strains on your industry. So you know, what's going on and you, know, you said you rebranded. Yeah, look, it's been a, um, I think it's well known, it's been a, a, a tough um, uh, last few years for most telcos in the world. Uh, I was listening to Red Hat talking yesterday about um, 60 consecutive quarters or more of growth. I don't think there's any uh, telco in the world uh, probably has the same story. Uh, like most, we're facing kind of decline in all the traditional revenues, like voice and text and things like that. Mm -hmm. So we're all having to kind of rebrand ourselves um, and deliver much higher levels of customer service. People expect the same levels of service from us that they do from Amazon and Google and everyone else. So in Spark, what that means to us is we've moved into lots of new things. As you say, things like ICT. We're now very big in cloud. We've recently um, launched a uh, Spark sports brand and we've got streaming rights to key events like um, Formula One. Uh, we're mm. going to uh, stream the Rugby World Cup, which is a massive event for New Zealanders, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. looking forward to seeing that uh, in Ireland and the All Blacks in the final mm -hmm. um, right. in September <laughs> this year. So yeah, a lot going on. Uh, tough times, but um, forcing us to keep changing every year. And, and so ab about these changes that you're making, whether you know, technologically based, let's just deal with that. What is that ultimately um, going to do for you, I think, in terms of better customer service delivery? So, um, you, you've got inherent challenges, you've talked about them at all, that, that the world's changing, right? How we use this medium, this communication uh, opportunity is changing. And, and you've been, not you, but you're just a little behind the wave. Hard to keep up with it, Yes. right? So rapidly changing. How much of a challenge is that? And then. And then how are you going to address this going forward? How do you stay relevant? Yeah, I think we're, we're lucky um, in one regard because uh, if I look back about five, seven years ago, we were like most um, traditional telcos. We had a spaghetti, for want of a better description of systems, and um, mm -hmm. we had always multiples of everything. At mm -hmm. the time, we had 19 integration layers and 10 billing systems, and it wasn't uncommon, but way back in 2012, we actually embarked on a massive transformation program, and we spent five years consolidating all of that mm -hmm. infrastructure, so mm -hmm. going into about 2017, we were very lucky in that we had a massive foundation laid already, so mm -hmm. what that then enabled us to do was to actually push away you know, calls from our contact centers into mobile apps, into mm -hmm you know, digital adoption. Um, we've been a big uh, embracer of uh, things like big data and robotic process automation as well mm -hmm. to try and take cost out of our industry. Mm -hmm. So 
I think we're, we're quite well placed. Now that allows us to do things like innovate uh, new products for our customers. So we bundle things like Spotify and Netflix, you know. Mm -hmm. It allows us to introduce things like Sparkzort brand, which we couldn't have done five years ago before the transformation. We just wouldn't have been able to enable these things with our existing kind of legacy IT estate. So, so how's open source play in all this for you? Yeah, open source, I suppose our first uh, foray into open source was when we went uh, to start embracing big data and automation. So we started using things like um, Hadoop and various other things and our entire platform is based around open source. Mm -hmm. Uh, we changed to uh, an IMS network recently and we started embracing things like OpenStack and then it really took us to a, um, a new level recently when we uh, started working on uh, Red Hat's Fuse and OpenShift, we started implementing that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, at the OpenStack show for many years, we, the last few years we saw the telcos coming in for specifically for network function for exposition or NFV. Yeah. Is that what you're using in that space? Yeah, we are. Uh, interestingly, at this conference I've heard a lot of people uh, talk about OpenShift and, um, uh, and OpenStack, obviously, particularly in the telco game. We actually came out a, a bit differently from the application space. So we had a, um, uh, an integration platform that we had put in through this uh, transformation phase, which was, it had served us well uh, and was connecting all of our 40, 50 systems together. Uh, but it was coming up to a life cycle event and we decided we'd, we'd uh, look externally and see had we options beyond just upgrading it. So we started looking to, um, we started looking around and we effectively found Fuse and in bringing in Fuse, we then brought OpenShift in, mm -hmm. which is quite different to what I've seen from a number of other people. They're bringing in things like OpenShift and building on top of it. We, we did it the other way around, you know? Mm -hmm. And we did it primarily for, uh, for cost reasons, you know? Yeah, so, mm -hmm. talk a little bit about that, that impact of Fuse and OpenShift, what that means. Were you already down the containerization journey, or did, no. did, did that help, uh, no, help we, drive some of that modernization? It, it, that's exactly what yeah. happened. We, we, if I'm honest, we hadn't. Um, we hadn't really explored containerization too much because we had come to the end of our kind of transformation journey. Open source and containerization wasn't around when, when we went through that, so we kind of needed some really core reasons to move on. So, um, yeah, effectively what happened was we, we, we looked at Fuse, it, uh, we, as I say, primarily for cost, but we were looking for something that we could migrate to where it makes sense. We were looking for something that wasn't a massive lift for the people who worked in our integration already, so they could be reskilled into it. Um, and interestingly, uh, we turned Agile recently, which, which has changed the way we look at and the needs of our systems. So our old integration platform, if we needed to deploy a change, we had to take an outage, mm -hmm. which was fine when we had um, a centralized IT department who deployed once a month and took a two hour, uh, two hour outage. But when you have 20 tribes all developing features in isolation <laughs> and they want to go straight through to production, if everybody took an outage, then our systems wouldn't really be up very often. So one of the key things that we were looking at for our new integration platform was, can we deploy hot and can we scale? So that's basically where, uh, where Fuse came into it. Okay, so can you? We can and we do. <laughs> um, still a little bit nervous about pressing the button midday right. and simultaneously and yeah. thinking, this is really going to work, yeah, right? We saw it today, though, <laughs> on the demo stage, right? On the keynote, we saw, you know, uh, you know simultaneous yeah. operations. Yeah. Going on. No, so we do it, and yeah. uh, they normally don't tell me when they're doing it. They just do it <laughs> and tell me it worked afterwards. But no, it's actually been really successful, and we've. Um, you know, you can imagine connecting 40 or 50 systems together, mm. there's effectively the equivalent of about 2,000 APIs, and we managed to migrate, we're about, we're about 70% of the way through, but we managed to migrate um, uh, those without actually impacting the systems that use them, and uh, it's probably mm. been one of our most successful IT projects that I've seen. Hmm. Yeah, well, it, it's funny, you, you, you talked about, you said we were towards the end of our transformation journey, and of course, I think we all understand, it, it, it is just, I might have reached a <laughs> marker in my journey, a but pause. it needs to be a continuous uh, process, and you went through an agile transformation, so talk, bring us in a little bit, organizationally, what happened there, you know, some of the good, the bad, and the ugly of <laughs> agile, because, I mean, agile is always an ongoing uh, thing. <laughs> yeah, so, about uh, start of last year, 
we started to think about Agile and you know, the need to change our ways of working. Uh, we looked at a number of models overseas in companies like Spotify and various banks, mm -hmm. and we settled on a model of um, chapter and tribes. Um, and we took about six months actually in trying, in looking at what that meant for us as an organization and all of the things that we needed to change. Everything from people's contracts you know, to people's titles. We got rid of all complex titles and uh, moved on to simple things like developer, tester, etc. cetera. Uh, we had to train our people in Agile, so we ran boot camps for over 2,000 people. We mm. had one with 500 people attend. We had to review all of our processes um, and see how would, where we had centralized things like IT governance or procurement, how do you actually manage this when you have up to 20 different people effectively or tribes doing their own mm -hmm. development. So over a, over a period of about six months, we went through all of these. Um, we started with a concept of um, some forerunner tribes so we could figure out how this thing actually works, you know, mm. and get some lessons. And then on the 1st of July last year, about 2,000 people in various buildings um, packed up their stuff on their desk and um, moved into uh, a, a new world, into their tribes with different working spaces and, you know, different collaboration areas and all the tools that we need. So, yeah, we're about uh, nine, months, uh, nine months down that journey now, and yeah, it's been, it's been good. H how many total employees? We have about 5,000 in 5, total. 5,000, so you had 500 at one time, 10% of your workforce in training at one time. That's right, yeah, absolutely. How, how do you keep the wheels on the bus wow. rolling? Because, I mean, you're asking people not only to change their, you know, learn new skills, but learn them in a new environment and learn them literally in a new place. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's just massive change. And I think for just, we're human beings, we're creatures of habit to a certain extent. That's got it, you had to hit a, a lot of bumps along yeah, the way. Yeah, so, so one of the key things we did up front was we said, the operate part of our business, which is effectively things like our contact center, our sales staff, our service desks, we will not go agile with those on the first day because they operate in a, a slightly different way of working, the people in our stores, et cetera. So we had a concept of agile light and agile heavy, so mm -hmm. we kind of parked them for a minute, so that we, or at the time, so that we wouldn't um, do exactly what you okay. say and let the wheels, fall off the wheels fall off the trolley. And we took the people that were the IT developers, the product development staff, and all of that, which which came to about just over about 2,000 people, and we firstly flipped those 2,000 people and put those through boot camp. But even, as you say, scheduling the boot camps, uh, we were very, we made sure that we always had the right people on the ground, and you know, we would schedule smaller boot camps for them later if we needed to do it, but yeah. So, nine months in now, you're talking to your peers if they're going to go through. Any, any key learnings? What were some of the most challenging things uh, that uh, you, you ran into? Uh, I think probably the major one is that um, you know agile at its heart is a is a way of working, and and despite the name, it's actually quite prescriptive in how you should work. You know, mm. uh, when you pick up the the agile book, it tells you all the ceremonies you need to run and the processes that you need to run as well. Um, and I think what you need to be you need to be pragmatic in how you implement it because there are so many different flavors of agile. The one flavor, even with an organization of Spark size, um, it doesn't it doesn't work, you know. So the people, the tribes and squads that are building out new products, compared to the tribes that are doing things like upgrading systems, they will work in different ways. So I think the first thing is, you know, be pragmatic, take the take the goodness and the intent of Agile, but um, you know, implement it and how it works for you. Um, and there's some other practical considerations, like we had. Um, Prior to being agile, we had quite a large number of our technology partners were based offshore in India, and um, you know it's quite difficult to run a 10 a.m. a 10 a.m. stand up in New Zealand, setting the priorities for the day mm -hmm. um, and the sprint plans when you know four members of your team are asleep in India. You know they're missing out on all mm -hmm. of that, um, the goodness and, and the co-location and the sharing. So one of the things we we had anticipated that, luckily enough, so we had. Uh, we had moved a lot of those people on shore in advance of Agile, you know. Mm -hmm. But it is a big cultural change for, for everyone in the organization, not least the, um, the leadership teams as well, you know. Well, you got through it. 
We you, got you've there. managed, There's right? no going back, yeah. Absolutely. No, yeah. you're in the deep end now. <laughs> yeah, so, well, now thanks for being with us. Uh, we appreciate the, uh, the time here to join us here on theCUBE. And I think that an Irishman is always welcomed in Boston. Thank you very right. much. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We've been enjoying the hospitality. I'll bet you have. Yeah, the door's <laughs> always open much. for you. Thank you very much. Now Fitzgerald joining us from Spark NZ. Back with more here on theCUBE. You're watching us live at the Red Hat Summit 2019.